Well, hello, and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today, man, am I excited. I am excited because today I have our first author interview of 2021. Yes, the author interviews are back. Olga Grushin is our guest on the show, and she's here to talk about her new book, The Charmed Wife, which was published by G.P. Putnam Sons just last week on January 12th. So the book is hot off the presses, and I'm going to roll that interview momentarily. But the conversation I had with Olga got me to thinking about the idea of happily ever after and how that idea may have poisoned us, much like the apple poison uh, Snow White ingested from her uh, wicked, was it a wicked stepmother in Snow White? Was that what it was? I think that's what it was. Nevertheless, she was wicked. Um, and there was an apple involved. And I eat an apple every day. It's supposed to keep the doctor away, but not for uh, not for Snow White, apparently. Um, but here, here's what I mean by, by this idea of happily ever after and how it could have poisoned us. You know, life and relationships aren't always happily ever after. Now, some might argue most of the time they're not happily ever after. But, you know, data wise, you know, according to the American Psychological Association, the old APA, 40 to 50 percent of marriages in the United States end in divorce. Yet many of us, you know, grow up believing that, you know, we meet Mr. or Mrs. Wright, we fall in love and, and we live happily ever after. But, um, you know, those fairy tales, you know, they leave out the struggle, you know, they leave out the struggle. They leave out the part where like Snow White eventually resents the prince and uses sex as a negotiating tool or or they leave out how, you know, Aladdin you know, eventually takes Jasmine for granted and, and that causes her to seek comfort outside of their marriage, you know. It leaves out those parts, those parts of real life. You know, does anyone ever wind up in marriage counseling in these fairy tales? You know, maybe that's where these stories should begin, you know, as like flashbacks being told from each other's, you know, point of view uh, in therapy, you know. But what would, the, what would that theme park look like? You know, the Disney theme parks are oftentimes, you know, built around, you know, the, the princesses and, and the fairy tales. But, you know, imagine a, a theme park built on on this you know, the, all the rides are sponsored by divorce attorneys, you know, marriage counselors and dating apps. You know, imagine like standing in line on, on a ride, you know, for a ride called the marriage coaster. <laughs> it's, it's billed as the biggest mistake of your life. I don't know. It's terrible. It's a terrible notion. But, you know, all you see is ads for flat fee divorces on that. I don't know. You know, and instead of maybe instead of fairy godmothers walking around the park singing, Bippity boppity boo. You've got like cantankerous old people walking around saying, I told them they were too young to get married. But God, this intro is taking a really odd turn. Um, so much for doing it stream of consciousness. Uh, but it did remind me, you know, we because we were talking about um, obviously Olga's book and we were talking about fairy tales. And, and I started to remember that, you know, my grandmother, you know, when I was growing up, you know, I had my twin brother, Jimmy. I've talked about him before. But, our, you know, our grandmother used to read us stories every night. And, and one of my favorites was always Jack and the Beanstalk. And she, she'd always tell whatever story she would tell. She always told from memory. Like it always had the, the Grandma Fossey flair. And that's Fossey, not Fauci. Same spelling. We pronounce it differently. I don't know who's right or who's wrong. Um, but to us, she was Grandma Fossey. Anyway, um, but I, I would tell my kids that story, too. And, and, you know, when the kids were younger, I realized that like Jack he was kind of a thief, you know, and he wasn't that smart. He was, he, and clearly into psychedelics, right? You know, he sells the family cow in exchange for magic beans. And then he apparently trips his butt off while climbing a beanstalk where he then steals a goose that lays a golden egg from a giant who lives in a castle in the sky. I mean, come on, put that pitch on paper. You know, what agent's going to take interest in that? I don't know. I don't know. It seems a little far fetched to me. It's more like more likely that he, you know, takes some magic beans and then wind up as the victim on SVU, you know, with Benson and Stabler standing over his corpse, wondering who got the poor boy after he left a sex club in the East Village. The psychedelics are no good for you. Anyway, as you can tell, I'm in a very, very silly mood today. Uh, we moved my son into college the other day. Um, and this morning I wake up and I, I go on Facebook because I'm old. I'm old and Facebook is still apparently relevant to me. And I see, you know, pictures from, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, you know, they do that whole picture of the day thing. And there was a picture of my son in his bed 
uh, he was surrounded by all of his stuffed animals. You know, he had a lot of stuffed animals as a kid. And he loved his little stuffies and, and all his stuffies like surrounded him. He looked like St. Francis, you know, and uh, yeah, he looked like St. Francis. And, and, you know, not to be outdone, though, by all the inanimate stuffed animals around the room. Our dog, Riley, who's still with us today. She's 14. We're on borrowed time with her. Her breath smells like an autopsy, but, you know, we're keeping her around. Anyway, she uh, she's in the picture. And when I saw that picture this morning, it made me smile because I, I remember clearest day. I remember taking that picture and, you know, it felt like yesterday. It felt like yesterday my son was in that bed surrounded by the stuffed animals and the dog on the floor. And it made me sad. I mean, it made me happy because I love the picture, but it made me sad because I miss him. I miss him when he was that age, when he was you know a little guy. And but it also reminded me that when he was that age and we were at Disney, all he wanted, all he wanted was a Cinderella doll. That's it. That's what he wanted. Daddy, can I have a Cinderella doll? We got one for him. But that brings us full circle because Olga Grushin's new book, The Charmed Wife, picks up 13 years after Cinderella marries Prince Charming, who it turns out may not be so charming after all. So here it is, my inner, my interview, my conversation. It's not an interview, it's a conversation. My conversation with the wonderfully talented Olga Grushin. Thank you so much for having me. So I was born in Russia, in Moscow, and I grew up in Moscow and in Prague. When I was five years old, my family moved to Prague for five years. So I lived there in the very formative years between five and ten. And then we went back to Moscow, and I spent my adolescence during uh, the turbulent perestroika years. And then when I was 18, I came to the U.S. for college. So that's that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> what was it like growing up in, in Moscow when you did? Well, so I think so much of it comes, to, comes down to your family. You know, in my family, um, I guess we were, you know, what's termed intelligentsia in Russia. Um, everybody was very progressive. Everybody um, knew about the West. People have traveled abroad. Um, so, and of course we lived abroad for some of it. So I think it was a very different experience from uh, what a lot of people growing up in the Soviet Union experience. Um, we had, you know, we had your typical kind of what they call kitchen conversations, you know, where people um, discussed very subversive topics. And of course, uh, we had literature that was banned, um, you know, available in uh, typed copies. So I grew up reading Ahmadova's Requiem and Gumilov and Pasternak and so many things that had not been widely available. So it was very different, but there was a great sense of disconnect between what I saw at home and my public life, so to speak, you know, school. Um, not so much in Prague, but when we came back, when I was 10, um, we were assigned uh, schools based on the district, much as here with public schools. And the school that I went to was uh, incredibly conservative and what you would imagine your typical, you know, young pioneers marching. And I had a very vivid memory on the day that uh, Brezhnev died. Our history teacher said, children, I have terrible news for you. This was in the morning. He made the announcement. He said, Brezhnev died. Uh, so there was going to be a nuclear war with America. So run home, children, and tell your parents to prepare. So, of course, we were all terrified. You know, we were all 11, 12 at the time, and we ran home. Um, my school was two blocks away, so I remember just dashing home and coming to the apartment to the champagne corks popping. <laughs> so, again, a disconnect. <laughs> wow, that, that that's one that, that that's some kind of contrast right there in terms of what you're hearing from from school and then what you're experiencing at home. It sounds like your your family wasn't too worried about uh, sudden death and nuclear nuclear war. No, no, they were not. Um, but uh, when I was 13, I switched to uh, a different school. And that one was a, also a very liberal school um, that you had to apply to and take exams for. It was an English language school. So I think um, uh, 
great reason behind my being here and my writing my books in English was that school because um, it was uh, they, they had some what they call special education schools all over the city where they would be concentrating on a particular subject languages or mathematics or sciences arts what have you so this one was um, the English school and we were expected to have some lessons in English and we read uh, Salinger's Catcher in the Rye and Shakespeare and what have you in the vernacular you know when when I was again 14 15 so it was kind of an education in American literature and you know English language classics yeah. at an early age so yeah. again different from <laughs> what you would expect <laughs> Probably the same things we were reading, you know, here when we when we were that age. I remember reading Catcher in the Rye and uh, and being, you know, wanting to hang out with Holden Caulfield. If, if my um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord of the Flies was another big one that we read when I was little. Yeah, I'm well, not little, 14. Well, that's still little, but you know what I mean? <laughs> well, when, when you were just kind of if we're staying in your early teenage years for a bit, what did you want to be when you were when you were that age? Did you have a sense then that you wanted to to be a writer and write for a living or did did you have other dreams no no i knew i was going to be a writer when i was four so it was never anything else <laughs> it's very boring i know but i come from a family in which pretty much everybody had some connection with uh, literature language journalism editing um, my gr- grandmother was uh, a nonfiction writer and then everybody else i won't go through the long list of all my relatives but let's just say everybody including you know sisters-in-law and you know nephews and whatnot was in journalism um, so um, it was kind of a, a, an obvious choice. And I think made the grand announcement when I was four. And I started writing my first uh, stories when I was four. And I wrote my first chapter book when I was seven. My father uh, typed it and bound it. We had this tradition from then until I was a teenager um, that every year I would write one book length book and my dad would type it and I would illustrate it and we would bind it and then present it to my mother on her uh, birthday. So we have a few of those books still <laughs> uh, present, you know, somewhere in my shoebox upstairs in the closet. Um, now I feel terrible for like giving my mother an ashtray for her birthday when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> but in fairness to her, she used to like to smoke. So, you know, well, there you go. Whatever makes them happy, right? <laughs> yeah, thankfully, she did quit back in the 80s. So. Um, well, you so you lived in um, the Soviet Union until until about when? Until I was 18. 18. And then 18, you come over to the United States? Yes. So I uh, you graduate from high school at 17 in Russia and I um, graduated and I, um, no surprise there, joined the journalism department at Moscow State University. Um, and then um, in my freshman year there, um, I met with a delegation of American professors from, as it happened, Emory University. Um, and uh, one of them, Dr. Ellen Mitzkevich, uh, kind of asked me very unexpectedly if I would be interested in studying uh, at Emory. And at that point, uh, this is 87, 88, 89, 88. Yeah. So nobody had um, done that. Nobody had um, crossed the ocean and gone to America as a Russian citizen. So I said, oh, sure. No, I mean, it sounded lovely, but of course I didn't think anything of it. Um, but then they invited me and they gave me a full scholarship um, and uh, I came. Um, so I just turned 18. This was 89. And then I found out that <laughs> to my great surprise, I was actually the very first Russian student ever to attend a four-year American college. So um, that was quite unexpected. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So what was it like? Was this your first time in the United States? When you oh, were- absolutely. Yeah. yeah okay. oh, oh. What was it like? Like you, you get off the plane, what emotions are you experiencing? What are you noticing? What What do you remember from that time? Yeah. So <laughs> um, my mother, of course, made all of my clothes. You know, we didn't really have stores uh, with fully stocked wardrobes available. And I remember that uh, she thought it would be a nice touch if I arrived wearing uh, red, white and blue. So she made me, as I recall, this bright red suit. I was actually wearing a red jacket and a red skirt. I probably looked like a stewardess. I had a white blouse and some, I, I forget what was blue, but something was blue. Um, and I had $4 in my pocket because 
owning foreign currency was illegal back then. Again, this is 89. And uh, my parents had had some, well, four dollars from their trip abroad, or I forget exactly how they can buy four dollars, but I had four dollars and I had no idea what it meant. I thought it was a fortune. So uh, Emory paid for my flight. It was a Delta flight, as I recall. I got on the plane, I had the four dollars in the you know, pocket of my bright red jacket. And uh, then on the plane, the stewardess came by offering headphones and the headphones cost five. And that was my moment of realization, sort of reality sinking in, oh, <laughs> so I can't afford to buy headphones. So yeah, I arrived, it was you know quite overwhelming. I was um, met with representatives from memory. That was a bit of a blur, but I think I, I landed in New York. And met was met with someone from Emory, and they, you know, accompanied me all the way to Atlanta. That part I completely do not remember. Mm. And then when I um, landed in Atlanta, it was even more of a blur because I just I didn't know there would be media attention, and you know, maybe not right away. This first week is kind of it's interesting to think back on it now because. I gave interviews. There were, I think, live appearances on CNN, Good Morning America. You know, people followed me around with cameras on campus for a day. And yeah, <laughs> it's it, it was a bit overwhelming, to be honest. Yeah. But then, you know, after the first week, it, it all completely calmed down and my 15 minutes were over. And then I became a regular Emory student and the rest of it was fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. tell me, um, you, uh, you you said at Emory. What happened after Emory? So you you do your you graduate from Emory. And, yes. Um, what's uh, what's next for you? Well, I always knew I wanted to be a writer, but I had to adjust my expectations because um, I realized that I would have to switch to English. I got married while I was at Emory, and so I, you know, realized that I would be here, um, and then that I had to give up my Russian and start writing in a new language. So of course that was traumatic and it was a readjustment and um, I thought that I would need some sort of a career in the meantime while I spent a few years getting my English to where my Russian had been and um, the only thing that had occurred to me was law school so I applied to law schools and um, then once I was accepted, I very wisely, surprisingly, I still marvel that nobody was giving me any advice. But at 21, I somehow decided not to accept any of the, um, you know, of the law school acceptances and instead spend a year, spend a year working at a, at a law firm. Mm -hmm. And so we moved to D.C. and I worked at a law firm for a year. And that was enough to realize that it just was not for me. And uh, so after that, I just went through a series of of different jobs. I worked as a Russian translator at the World Bank for a while. I waited tables. I yeah, worked in a post office. I did all sorts of really random, interesting things that I think helped me overall, you know, form my idea of what America was like. Um, but all through all of that, I wrote. And then I started publishing my first short stories. And then I found a job that became my profession. Um, I worked as an editor for um, Harvard University's uh, Research Institute, Dumbarton Oaks here in Washington, DC. And that's where I stayed until I felt confident enough to actually leave and make a living writing. And that was many years and I loved doing it. And it was a wonderful place. And you know, I always felt like if I ever need to pull back on any career, I'm an editor by profession, like nonfiction academic editor. So that's, that's what I did. Yeah. How do you, how do you, um, and, and this is kind of a, a broad question, but how would you say your sort of your childhood and your background has impacted the stories you come up with? Mm, well, it set a tone for a lot of what I'm interested in, of course. Yeah, I grew up reading Russian literature and my own writing, I think, really it has evolved from, you know, that kind of the Russian classical tradition. There is the 19th century realism, and then there is this rich vein of fantastical. You know, you think Gogol and Sam Chekhov and Dostoevsky, they all had these um, kind of very surreal stories about doubles and uh, people's noses walking about on their own and what have you. So um, that formed what I liked reading and eventually what I started writing, you know, sort of 
um, they call it magic realism. I don't know if I'm comfortable with the term, but the sort of uh, on a surface, maybe realistic stories that then sort of veer into the sphere of the dreamlike and the fantastical. But also growing up in Russia, there were just so many amazing people around and amazing stories. And I was, of course, incredibly lucky to have the parents I had and to know their friends. They were friends with a lot of artists and poets. And we always had just, you know, fascinating conversations in the house and very interesting people. And um, none of the books I write are autobiographical at all, um, but they do draw in some ways on, obviously, on my upbringing or on the things that were of interest to me. In fact, uh, the previous novel I wrote, 40 Rooms, it starts off, again, the the novel itself is not autobiographical, but it's about uh, a Russian girl who is born in Russia and then eventually comes to the United States. And the Russian are bringing the parts of the book. It's set in 40 chapters. Each of them is a room in which she lives from childhood to old age, so 40 rooms. And the Russian rooms, the Moscow rooms, they were sort of based on the atmosphere of my upbringing, on the, you know, the kind of the heady conversations, reading of the band poetry at night, you know, the, the sort of a kind of very magical uh, intense mood, if you will. Um, but I don't use the actual stories. Um, and with later books, I've started departing from Russian themes as well, which is not to say that I'll never go back to them because I'm sure I will to some extent. Uh, but only the first two novels were actually set in the Soviet Union and I've sort of moved on. Yeah. When, when I want to go to, to your first novel for a minute, then we'll go into the latest. But uh, yes. a lot of the people who listen to this, you know, are, are aspiring authors themselves. Mm-hmm. They're, they're always curious to hear the path to publishing. So what was your path to, to getting your first novel published? You know, it was inc- inc- just incredibly straightforward. And I think it's a kind of story that should encourage aspiring writers because I had no connections at all in the industry. I did not know any writers myself. I had never taken a single writing class in my life and still have not to this day. Um, I've taught a couple, but uh, I've never taken any. And so it was really just at first kind of learning about writing by writing short stories in a little basement apartment on a tiny little typewriter and sending them out um, based on the instructions I read in Writer's Digest and How to Break into Print manual. Um, Double spacing was very important, as I recall. (laughs) And then, um, you know, once I felt like I've had enough credits, for some reason, 10 was a magic number. I decided that once I published 10 short stories, I will then turn to my first novel. And I'm a novelist by nature. I'm, I write short stories on occasion, but um, I like kind of layered puzzle-like stories that you can unravel and look at from many different angles. And you can't really do that in a short story. So I always knew that the short stories were stepping stones to doing what I really wanted to do. So once I had those 10 credits, I felt that was enough to can be taken seriously by an agent. I wrote my first novel and um, I sent out, you know, again, I've had these books, you know, uh, writer's market and guide to literary agents. And I uh, poured through them looking for people who represented fiction that was similar to mine. And that's important. So in my case, I looked for people who represented fiction that took risks um, that was not, you know, afraid to tell a nonlinear story. Um, and then I wrote to, you know, five agents, I think. And, you know, I got interest from two right away. Uh, one of them actually wanted me to, um, she, th- I found an agent pretty much in the first week, but interestingly enough, she wanted me to uh, rewrite the ending of the book. And I said no, which a part of me felt like I was crazy because here I was, you know, with no connections, lending an agent. She actually represented some pretty, you know, big authors and I was thrilled. But then when I realized what she wanted me to do, it just didn't feel right at all to the book. Um, and I marveled at myself, but I said, no, thank you. And um, then a couple of weeks later, I heard from another agent, and that's the agent I've been ever since. He's wonderful, Warren Frazier. Uh, back then, he represented Mark Danielewski's House of Leaves, 
uh, if you know that work. So that was pretty much what, you know, it's, it's um, a, a very unusual book. So, yeah, so, I, you know, I got in a way very lucky, but it was as straightforward and as kind of textbook <laughs> well, it's, as it, you can get. <laughs> and then, you know, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say it's luck, but it's also talent. I mean, if, if, if the story wasn't there, if the capability wasn't there, if you didn't have that, I mean, you set yourself up with, with credibility mm-hmm. at the get go, um, which yeah. um, obviously, you know, it, 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 it got you, it got them to open up your query letter versus to, to stick it off in, into the side or in, into a slush pile, I think. Well, actually, <laughs> I think my agent sometimes tells a story, and I don't know if he's joking, that uh, when he saw that I was born in Russia and that I was really Russian and I wrote this novel, he felt like having a laugh. And so he asked for, you know, the beginning of the book or something to, you know, to just kind of see how awful my English was. And then, you know, he asked the rest. And then <laughs> within two days, um, he signed me on and then... Um, it took a little bit to find the right publisher, but uh, I was also very, very lucky. I've stayed with the same publisher with all my books too, which is, is I um, understand now quite unusual. Um, yeah. But I've been with Putnam, and my first editor was the wonderful Marion Wood. She, she passed away this year, um, sadly, but uh, she was my editor for the first three books, and uh, she was just brilliant. And you know, she was my entry into this world, and I couldn't have wished for. And the better everyone, agent, editor, publisher. It was just, you know, so I did get very lucky. I mean, you know, it's it's hard to find a, such a perfect match as I did right from the start. Yeah. Well, you know, what, what I also love about that story is the fact that with that with that first agent who showed interest, who wanted you to, to change the ending, how you stood your ground. And, you know, you, you, you felt your, almost your own conviction not to give in. I'm sure it must have been tempting to, because you have, you know, this perspective, you know, this this pearl of great price out there, right? This this person who can get you kind of what you want, which is this this first book deal, but but you, you had the 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 strength and foresight to to say no. You know, it really was not an agonizing decision at all in retrospect. I mean, it should have been probably, but it just wasn't because I felt like you know, someone showed interest right away you know probably i'll find someone else who might be interested but the ending of the book uh, was just so important and yeah i was open of course to certain rewrites and to suggestions and that's inevitable and that does happen once the book is accepted but that particular change just it would change the whole nature of the book in my mind and so that, you know, and so I, you know, it just wasn't a suggestion that that felt right to me at all. Yeah. Well, let's talk about The Charmed Wife, because yes. <laughs> that's what that's your latest. It's I know it's it's recently been uh, recently been published. Um, I'm fascinated by just the premise behind the book. Uh, I, I, I do want to tell a quick story, which is, you know, um, I have three kids. They're triplets. They're 18 years old now. When they were younger, we did what what families do, and we go down to Disney World. Mm-hmm. And um, my son. So we have two girls and a boy. Mm-hmm. And my son was the one who was begging, begging us to buy him a Cinderella doll. That's all <laughs> he wanted from the trip to Disney, and it wasn't the girls. It was oh, my. That's he, was so cute. <laughs> he was fascinated with the story of Cinderella, and you know, at the time, he's probably four or five years old. And, you know, he's not looking at the deeper meaning of the story. He's not looking at it from, you know, an adult's point of view. He's a kid. It's this beautiful doll. He wants to play with it. Um, and then I, I read the, uh, you know, the, the promotional materials I was sent for The Charmed Wife. And I just, I remembered that story. Oh. <laughs> uh, but just you know, now knowing that, you know, perhaps it, it happily ever after didn't happen for, for uh, Cinderella. How did you... Um, how did you come up with the idea for this? Or when, when did when did this idea come to you? So several things. I think all my ideas just pop into my head seemingly out of nowhere one day. I'm just sitting there and there it is. But so much goes into it before and there's so much that is invisible. And so for this one, I think there were several components. One, my lifelong interest in fairy tales. Um, this book is not just a story of Cinderella, but it's uh, you know a tapestry of many, many different fairy tales that are all uh, woven together and there are different connections and uh, they play different roles. So there's Sleeping Beauty and 12 Dancing Princesses 
Alice and uh, Rapunzel and the Red Riding Hood, so many. So um, that's one. I grew up reading fairy tales when we lived in Prague for five years. Uh, of course, Prague itself is a fairy tale place. And the books I favored when I was a child uh, were mostly fairy tales. So um, so a lifelong interest there. In fact, the very first novel that I mentioned when I was seven, my first chapter book was called The Tale of a Lazy Princess and a Brave Prince. And it was a fairy tale. And then I had this very interesting to me experience of trying to read the same stories to my own daughter when she was about that same age. I was seven when I wrote my first tale. So I tried reading those favorite stories to her when she was seven. And uh, she had an instant negative reaction. So quite opposite to your son, she hated it. She didn't want to hear about princesses. She said, oh, this is so boring. They don't do absolutely anything. They just sleep and wait for someone to wake them or they sit in the tower moping. I just don't want to hear any of those. Read me about dragons, read me about, you know, talking animals. Those are fine. So uh, she, yeah, she really, really, really hated them. And that got me thinking about the stories that my generation grew up reading, you know, the sort of the idea of the happily ever after um, that, you know, were sort of perpetuated by the Disney movies. Of course, I did not grow up watching Disney movies, but it's still the same idea. And then her generation, which, you know, I don't know if she is representative of it, but it seems to be that at least in her case, um, she was very anti-princesses. Um, and as it happened also at the same time, I was going through a divorce myself. So that sort of <laughs> combination of her reaction and my interest in fairy tales always and my own personal circumstances made me really question the whole premise of happily ever after. And then I started reading fairy tale theory and then I kind of walked deeper and deeper into the woods of the, you know, all these fascinating theories and concepts. And then I thought, you know, this would be a very interesting story to tell. So this book is not really a fantasy book. It uh, is a mix of reality and fantasy. And it, as, as are all my books, but there's more fantasy in it than in my previous books. But there's plenty of reality. It's a kind of book that has both talking mice and divorce attorneys. <laughs> and uh, it's... Um, it's, it's really, when I was writing it, I was thinking it's sort of an examination of contemporary women's issues, you know, our romantic expectations, marriage, motherhood, divorce, work, old age, what have you, through the fairy tale metaphors. So it's not really meant as a straightforward fantasy. It's more of a kind of a riff on these happily ever after cliches, if you will, that is then taken to an entirely different place. Do you, th- you know, just just going back to your experience, you know, seven years old reading fairy tales. Do you think that they set us up for disappointment later on in life? I mean, is there is there an element there of of that? I think if you buy it wholeheartedly, absolutely, because you know. But the fairy tales themselves, uh, there are so many different layers to them, and there are so many different versions. You know, if you read the kind of fluffier, more romantic Charles Perrault versions, perhaps. But if you read the grim versions, I don't know if they so much set you up for disappointment as they horrify you. <laughs> You're like, oh, <laughs> they're parents eating children. And they're, you know, that's Cinderella's uh, own version in Brothers Grimm is uh, it ends with the blinding of her sisters, not with some romantic fluff marriage or what have you. Um, they're very, very dark takes. So, um And that was what drew me partially to the subject is if you dig deeper, even the most common stories that that we tell, you know, like Cinderella, there are so many different versions and they go back centuries. And if you go far enough, the first known Cinderella version is actually Chinese and it's they're all different and they all have different emphasis and some are more subversive and some are less so. And in some Cinderella is more active and a lot less likable and 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 others you know the modern ones is she is just this obedient uh, girl but then of course there are now even modern retellings where you know think ever after with drew barrymore right or or um uh, la enchanted another one where cinderella is cursed with obedience right she's really a free spirit but she has to obey so there's so many different ways to tell the story um and 
you know, that's what I wanted to play with. I wanted to go out there and play with all these images and, you know, yeah. metaphors and, and plots and just to turn them into something else. Right. And have, have a little fun with it too, I imagine. Oh yeah. It was so much fun to write. I think of all my books, this was the most fun and it is dark in places and there's sadness there too. And, um, you know, so it's, it's not, uh, it's not a kind of a young adult friendly romantic story it is not supposed to be but but yeah there's you know they're talking mice and there's their own story and there's a long running plot of of the mice and um i had so much fun with fairy godmother and the witch mm -hmm. who form a sort of triangle with with cinderella and they morph into something else again through the book so it was it was tremendous fun to write yeah, it reminds. I mean, not not. not you know, I haven't read the whole book, but I, you know, when I when I first read Wicked, mm -hmm. I saw like a different take on, you know, the Wizard of Oz, and and I I was I was captivated by it. just that that premise that mm -hmm. you know, maybe Dorothy wasn't great, mm -hmm. maybe the wizard wasn't great, and maybe the Wicked Witch of the West wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. love I love when when those like accepted notions are turned on their head a bit. Um, yeah. It, wicked, wicked. Wicked is terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I also you remember, you know, just being a kid is, you know, praying that my parents wouldn't get divorced mm -hmm. and they, they never mm -hmm. did. I mean, they're 63 years of marriage right now, but, um, oh, wow. uh, but, but because I never wanted a stepmother <laughs> or <laughs> step siblings because I was scared to death of, of, because they're always, you know, in, in many instances, portrayed as being wicked. Um, and on the flip side, uh, I never had a, a godmother who had magical power. So, uh, well, you know, my own take on divorce, um, and this is also something that comes from my experience is I was surprised, I guess, to realize that there is almost a stigma attached to single women and divorced women, you know, because, um, when you tell people you are getting divorced or are divorced, uh, the immediate reaction is one, oh, you poor thing, or, oh, it's his loss. And it doesn't occur to anyone that that might be for the better for everyone, or at least that seemed to be a kind of a, you know, a typical reaction. And that made me again, look at all these happily ever after stories. We're so used to couple them as a kind of uh, your golden measure, you know, standard of happiness. If you're not part of a couple, then clearly something in your life has not worked out. And to me, that was one of the more interesting things to explore because, um, and I don't want to give anything away about the book, but, you know, there are books out there where, you know, a woman in an unhappy marriage breaks free and goes out and finds herself. But most of these books always end with the woman finding a next man. <laughs> You know, it's sort of you're given that if a woman is to, you know, free herself and fly into the world, she will have some wonderful career change, of course, on all these books, but she will also have a brand new and much better man. And I find that so boring and also so old fashioned and so, I don't know, so irrelevant to your life as I see it, you know. And so for me, that was... One of the turning points in the book, there is a scene in which, so the, the book, the way it's structured is Cinderella wants to kill her Prince Charming. And that's how the book starts. We know that Cinderella has been married for 13 and a half years. Uh, she's fed up with her marriage. She goes to meet the witch and asks her for a potion to kill her husband. And then uh, the first part of the book is she looks back at her marriage and we learn gradually exactly what went wrong. Um, but then... Um, she kind of makes a choice at the crossroads as to what to do with the rest of her life. And she goes off into the woods and there's this, your archetypal, you know, uh, fairy tale character wandering through the dark woods, you know, the sort of the dark woods of the soul, if you will. And she comes to a fork in the road and she's given a magical choice. She can go left and then she will go back to her old life and everything will be just as before and nobody will remember anything that happened. Or she can go right and then she will have a bright new story and she will have another happily ever after and she will have a bright new prince. And, um, and so the, the choice that she makes at that point is the point at which in my mind, she ceases to be Cinderella and becomes someone else. And then the book goes into a very different direction and probably will surprise and unsettle a lot of people. But um, to me, it was so important not to fall into this uh, okay, if your happily ever after doesn't work out, that's okay. You can find another happily ever after. Yeah, it's just that, that to me is you know one of the kind of the main 
<laughs> problems with all these stories. Yeah. And yeah. The, gosh. Um, the, the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 just, you know, that single women and then you think about them, they're old hags or middle-aged nasty queens who are, you know, dead set on poisoning everybody with apples. <laughs> so not, not, right. not, not good role models. <laughs> no, not necessarily. <laughs> More than not necessarily, not at all. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, I had this like vision of 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 her approaching the witch, but the witch is like like a mafia hitman, you know, like like <laughs> like the Tony Soprano or something, and she's trying to hire him to off the Prince Charming. But um, but you do bring up an interesting point about you know divorce and and you know the, the a trope of of oh well the right man for you is out there after after mm-hmm, this happens mm-hmm. and and why why does that have to be the case? And I I I don't get it. I mean. Not that I'm, I, I can't really empathize with the situation, but I, I think it's it's wonderful to question, and and, yeah, to I just, and you know, and if you look at demographics, it, there's just so many single people out there these days, and some of them probably are not single by choice, but many of them are. Um, and by the way, I'm not single anymore. I have a partner, but um, that you know, I wasn't looking for one. I wasn't trying to you know, find someone. And I had some friends who were getting divorced, you know, roughly the same time. And they're, you know, some of them had this mindset, oh, okay, well, I need to go out there and I need to date and I need to find the next, you know. And that to me was just strange. I, I loved being in a different paradigm. And I think that contributed to my thinking about the stories. It was taking my character out of this very familiar stereotypical paradigm of mm-hmm. Disney like fairy tale happily ever after and letting her loose in a world that was unfamiliar and that was dreamlike that was strange it's an entirely different paradigm and an entirely different story and so I think you know I took risks in the book because it falls between genres and it starts in one place and ends in a very different place. And um, at the outset, you may have all these expectations that this is a revenge story or this is a, you know, um, a woman, you know, like a waiting to exhale, finding another romance story. And it's not. It's something else. Yeah. But I did have that, you know, in my own life, I had this wonderful feeling of freedom and of discovering all these new uh, kind of narratives available to me as as someone in a different paradigm, and and I wanted that feeling to be present in the book. You know, in my mind, it's a very um, kind of life affirming book. It's uh, it's a happier book than than my previous books. It's not cynical. It's not meant to be. It does take a hard harsh look at these stories that we're told, um, but once my Cinderella breaks out of this two dimensional. Um, kind of narrative, it, you know, it, it becomes, in my mind, a kind of a freeing, happy story, which, you know, I'm sure people who are dead set on the happily ever after may not see it that way, but it was for me. <laughs> Go ahead. Do, do you think you could have, this story could have come to you had you not gone through a divorce yourself and had you not been in a new paradigm? Probably. I mean, I've always been interested in fairy tales and I'm always interested in that, um, of gray area between reality and fantasy that kind of the dreamlike realm where things morph and but it wouldn't have been the same story for sure and again it's not autobiographical obviously it gave me the idea to explore the story uh but there's nothing about cinderella's marriage that's in any way like my marriage was mine wouldn't have made any kind of a an interesting story you know it's just your typical marriage but um hers of course uh, exaggerated things and it's quite dark in places and uh um, you know, and, and to me, you know, Cinderella was the perfect um, story through which to explore this, because if you think about all the um, most popular fairy tales, um, she is the one who travels from rags to riches and who is your archetypal good girl um, who just sort of is given this happiness just for being a good girl. Because if you think of the other ones, um, most of them are born princesses, first of all, you know, Sleeping Beauty, Rapunzel. Um, Snow White, uh, right? So uh, the fact that they eventually find their prince is not so dramatic. And then even those, they, you know, the sometimes they do a little more like Snow White, but Cinderella was your typical kind of passive character who is given happiness and uh, upward mobility in the world, if you will. 
Um, and so, yeah, so it would have been a different story. Maybe I would have taken a different fairy tale um, as, as, you know, kind of the basis for this exploration. But I always have these thematic blocks that I'd like to explore as a writer and mythology, fairy tales have always been a great interest to me. I may return to some of that at some point, not, not in the next book, but um, these, these have always been in the back of my mind as something I wanted to spend a couple of years with. Yeah. I, um, how, you know, you mentioned something before in, in that you had a lot of fun writing this one. Mm-hmm. Um, how important is fun to your writing process and finding the fun in your writing process? Um, well, I guess the short answer is not important at all. I don't expect to have fun. In fact, this was the first time that I did have fun and it was almost too easy to write in places, which made me very doubtful. You know, am I having too much fun? Is this really good writing? You know, um, Usually, I have to find a kind of a mental spot in my mind where I'm excited and, you know, the book feels alive. I can very much tell in in my mind the difference between the kind of, I don't want to say dead writing, but the the kind of writing, you know, as a writer, you write, you try to have schedules, you try to write every day. Uh, Some days you're on, some days you're not, it's obvious. So, Sometimes when you write, it just feels you're setting words on paper and it's important to do yeah, because you break through. But that moment when you break through to something else, I always feel it. That is very important. The story does have to feel alive. It has to feel urgent. It has to feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's breathing and it's, it's a real story to tell. So, you know, eventually I'll go back and throw away the dead words and leave just those that felt like that. But fun has not really been my experience before this book, to be honest. You know, a lot of the books, um, they explore very dark, heavy topics. You know, I have frustrated artists and totalitarian regimes. I have betrayals and I have people waiting in line for a year, hoping for some transforming experience. A lot of them were very emotional for me to write, you know. So, um, of course, you know, you right through, you know, grief and, and, and what, what have you. And my father actually passed away as I was writing the second book. So that went into it a little bit. Yeah. So this one was, was a, a very unusual experience for me. I had so much fun playing with all the quests and the talking mice and the, all the characters that I was turning upside down and, you know, all the, um, and of course the gradual transformation of the characters who do appear because, uh, when you first start reading the book, a lot of it reads, you know, very flat and stereotypical and it's intentional. So you just have to keep reading because, you know, the Cinderella is sort of your kind of bland singing with the birds twirling around kind of girl. And then there is the witch with her cauldron and her warts. And there is the fussy fairy godmother with her cups of tea and her knitting. Um, and then as the book goes on, they become someone else and they transform and it was so much fun to take these cliches and stereotypes and just run with it and take them in a into the direction of reality or you know a different world or what have you so it was yeah it was too much fun (laughs) have you um have you had any interest yet from uh movie studios um for for this particular project because i I, you know i I think about it as i absorb it as i hear you talking about it i could almost see you know at at this point in time this story actually playing very well on a on a screen yeah so i don't want to jinx it but there's there's (laughs) possibly some interest so uh, you know i really hope um i think of all my books too this one would really lend itself to um I haven't seen it as a TV show more than a movie more possibly mm-hmm. because um, it, it would be hard to do. I think it's possible, but it may be hard to do this in the space of two hours because uh, there are just so many layers. And, you know, I do have um, as my Cinderella goes out into the real world, she encounters all these other characters and so many of them have standalone stories. And, you know, so much of it was really my examination of storytelling and storytelling techniques. So many of the characters in the book tell stories. Um, There is, you know, the book opens with Cinderella telling a story to her own daughter, you know, once upon a time, there was a man who, 
And, um, you know, and then all of the characters within the book, they all have their stories and they tell it. So I think that I can just see those episodes, you know, one for each character. <laughs> but I, I don't want to get carried away. Because no, that would be, that would be neat. That, that would be amazing. <laughs> no, yeah, that reaches a whole other audience too. That's good. Your story in front of. Um, how, uh, how do you feel about that? I mean, have you ever done screen work, screenplay work or teleplay work before? Or would this be a first for you? I have not. Well, I don't know that I would be doing it myself. You know, this is it's a very, very different um, type of writing and type of media. And I am um, not myself sufficiently familiar with it. And I think, you know, once the book is finished, it goes out into the world. It's still yours. But there is a kind of a sense of distance. And so I think for me, uh, if the book were ever to become a movie, I would not feel at all possessive about it. It would be something else. You know, it would be something based on my novel, but uh, but it would be its own thing and I would let other people run with it I think I'm very different about translations translations I'm very meticulous about you know I helped with um, Russian translations of my first two books um, and you know there I was you know kind of agonizing over every single word but um, I think this is a completely different media and it's you know medium and it's um, you know it would be something else so I would I would let it go out there on its own <laughs> Oh, that that'll that probably save you a lot of aggravation too. I I would imagine. I don't know. I've never had this experience. It would be very interesting. But you know, I've seen you know you watch a movie based on something and you read something before or after and it's completely different and the accents are in the different places and then uh, you hear the author's takes and sometimes they say, "Oh, I loved it," and sometimes you sense that they really did not. You know, it's yeah, it's uh, I can see how it could be a painful process. But I think again, for me. I wouldn't necessarily think of it as, you know, my brainchild. I would just think of of it as something that was inspired by something I did, you know, but then, yeah, I, I, that's probably a better approach. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, right now, anyway, it is available in print, uh, The Charmed Wife, um, where if people wanted to learn more uh, about uh, the book, Olga, or more about you um, as the author, where where could they go to learn that? So I have a website, olgagrushen.com, but the place where I'm present mostly every day is Twitter, uh, and that's at Olga Grushen. Um, and that actually has been something um, that surprised me, but my publisher suggested that I uh, join some social media platform a year or two ago, and I was... Um, very uncertain about the idea because I felt like I can't express myself in little snippets of, you know, 280 characters. You know, I grew up reading War and Peace. Like, I need novels. <laughs> um, but it turned out to be a lovely place. I, I love it being part of book Twitter. And, you know, it's kind of like a community of readers that we tweet about books we read. Um, so that's one place if people want to contact me and approach me directly and then of course if they want to learn more about the charmed wife um you know they can read reviews or i've done several events with their videos off there's politics and prose and there's some podcasts now so <laughs> um so there's certain places and and goodreads too i actually wrote i i am active on goodreads and i wrote um a little description of the book on goodreads sort of cautioning readers that this is not your traditional fantasy and this is not really a young adult or children friendly book and that it is um you know if they do read it they should have an open mind because it, it really is a literary book it just it kind of masquerades as you know and I, again i i don't like labels i don't like the label of literary you know what does it even mean um where's the boundary but it's it it sort of masquerades as a fantasy book and it's you know it's it's really something else <laughs> um so yeah that's that's where i'm at right so i imagine this is your first book uh promotional tour during the COVID era. I don't want to assume it, but. Uh, no, it is. It is. I'm, I'm a slow writer. I, it takes me three, four years per book. So, yeah. yeah. So what's, what's that been like in terms of not being able to, to do it like in person or, I mean, we're doing this face to face, but mm -hmm. where everything is virtual. How do you, uh, how, how, how's that working out for you? <laughs> 
Uh, so pluses and minuses, but overall, I would say it's it's a very positive experience and surprisingly so. Uh, I like having a live audience when I do live readings. You know, it's important you see the people in the audience. You can see their reactions. You can sort of adjust um, what you're talking about based on how, you know, they're listening and you, you know, kind of adjust to pretty much your, the whole event. Now, of course, you can't see who is listening. Uh, so that's a bit of a disconnect. Uh, but what I really like is I think this new way of uh, staging these events as a conversation where I'm talking to you or if it's a bookstore event, it's not just me talking into my laptop for an hour, but it's usually done as a conversation with a fellow writer or, you know, uh, a bookseller. And that has been wonderful. You know, I felt like these events are so much more intimate and they're really like... Um, talking to a friend, I did one event with my good friend, Daniel Wallace, author of The Big Fish, who I've might known for a very, very long time now. And so that was just like talking to, you know, a good friend about writing. And then I did another one with Karen jo Joy Fowler, um, and she's wonderful. And again, you know, it's like basically talking to uh, someone who has also written books and who understands what it's like. Um, so a very different kind of experience. And I don't know that I would necessarily prefer one or the other, but I hope that even after COVID goes away, we still keep some of that. Because, you know, also you can do events everywhere. I did one reading in California. I did another one in Florida. Uh, you know, you, you couldn't do that without traveling all over the country. And that has just been wonderful. So I, I really hope that some of the virtual events will stay. Very good. Well, I do want to thank you for taking the time to chatting with me this morning. I know you're, uh, you're very busy, and I, I do appreciate uh, your time, and I wish you all the best with The Charmed Wife. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and for your interest in my work. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, that right there was a fun conversation. So uh, I do want to thank you for taking the time to listen to another episode of Uncorking a Story. And I'll remind you that if you like what you heard, please subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, of course, we'd appreciate it if you could tell about a friend about this podcast because we always want new listeners. Now, for more information on Olga Grushin, please check out her Twitter feed at Olga Grushin. And remember, her last book, her latest book, The Charmed Wife, which is certainly not your grandmother's fairy tale, if you hadn't guessed by now, is available now wherever books are sold. And for more information about me, you know, please check out at Uncorking a Story on all social media platforms. And feel free to visit uncorkingastory.com for more interviews with authors as well as motivational reflections inspired by the people I've had the privilege of interviewing. So until next time, this is Mike Carlin saying thanks for listening.